So my very first memory of going to see a show in the audience at the Grand was of course Panto, which I'm sure many others share the same early experiences. Um, it's very nice and it's a lovely feeling to think that I've gone from seeing pantomimes on the grand stage to being in the pantomimes on the grand stage as a, as a villain. Um, there was also another memory <laughs> which jogged and came to mind. Um, I think when I was three or four years old I went to see Postman Pat live and I remember crying the place down, screaming under the actual seats uh, because I knew, even at that age, I knew that that wasn't the real Postman Pat. That was clearly some man in just a wig, right? And also, I think I heard the lyrics wrong, and I was petrified he was going to turn up at my house and post lettuce through my door, and I didn't like healthy eating at the time. Um, anyway, I digress. The Swansea Grand Theatre, for me, has always been a, a safe haven of possibilities, and uh, certainly going to see shows like Pantomime as a child, or magical shows like Joseph, um, when they used to tour, the Bill Kenwright production used to tour here, um, I had an opportunity as part of um, a youth theatre to be in the choir. Um, and hearing that music, the inspirational music as a child, and hearing lyrics like, if you think it, want it, dream it, then it's real. You are what you feel. And that just sets a fire off uh, in your belly. And when you know the performing is something that you want to do, um, I will always go back to that as a happy memory and feeling that music and going, oh, I get it. I, I left school quite early. Um, I haven't got much of a, a formal education. All I've kind of ever known is performing and entertaining. And I've been very fortunate that um, since a young age, I've been employed as an actor, um, a comedian, a magician. And um, I've got to do quite a lot of those skills on the Swansea Grand Theatre stage. Well, both stages, really, the Arts Wing um, and the Main House. I've also been a member of the Harry Seacom Youth Theatre um, and that in itself was a wonderful uh, escapism uh, for somebody like me um, who had all this wound up energy and didn't know what to do with it and getting a chance to play roles that I would never probably get cast as <laughs> normally um, and being able to just create and the freedom and walking out onto the stage and at that young age hearing an audience clap at that young age feeling like oh you're doing well, you're doing good, it's a nice feeling. That, that is such an amazing, amazing feeling. It's, um, you know, it's quite remarkable, the magic that something like that has over you. Um, and I'm still here. Um, I'm fortunate to call the Swansea Grand really a second home of sorts. It's holy ground. It's um, a place that I'm, I'm at the most. I'm, I'm here um, teaching drama also as head of drama at the Mellon Theatre Arts. Um, as I said, I was a member of the Harry Seacom Youth Theatre. I'm a member of the Flewellyn Theatre Company, and I've had many opportunities to perform everything from Shakespeare to Brecht, um, lunchtime theatres, plays, and um, I got an opportunity to play Al Jolson in the one-man play, The Other Jolson. Uh, started at the Arts Wing, went on a tour, and a special one-off performance in 2019 uh, on the main stage. And to me, that that was everything. Um, it felt like coming home. Um, well, I did really because, like, I, as I said, I live. I, I don't leave the place. I've got a room upstairs and on suite. Um, I'm tease. So in my youth, um, I battled quite a bit with um, not having a formal education. Um, as I said, leaving school at such a young age and being different, really, um, always felt different. Um, as, a, as a young child that I was kind of not part of the same gang everybody else seemed to be in where they understood things and I'm there going is somebody going to tell me or oh, I'll we just go over there then shall we um, I always felt segregated um, having an opportunity to come to something like Harry's um, where you were just immediately accepted and you were championed and encouraged to be free to be creative and it's okay to be different um, that did wonders for me. I think that was a, a pivotal moment, um, certainly in believing in myself and just following a path that I liked, made sense. And um, yeah, I, I, I've got many difficulties still. Um, I'm dyslexic. I have uh, slight dyspraxia. I have ASD and ADHD. So 
I'm just a whirlpool of ideas and uh, yes, getting an opportunity at that age for, for somebody who has slight difficulties and um, many children today obviously are um, being diagnosed with things and having a youth theatre or having a club where you get a chance to perform and become somebody else for a small fraction of time, it's a release, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing and I think it should always be encouraged. So um, I find day-to-day -day tasks quite difficult. Um, you know, I suffer with social anxiety, um, and you know, I'm, I'm quite awkward in many situations. While always, I have foot-in-mouth disease, for example. I'll say the wrong thing. Um, so simple things like going and ordering something in a restaurant or um, having to complain about some something it, it totally fries me up. Um, being on stage where I'm a character and my brain is focused solely on, on one thing. Um, I, I haven't worded this correctly. Um, get an opportunity to be in a one-man play where um, it's just you on stage for over an hour, um, speaking, uh, singing, um, a one-man musical, really, I should have said. Uh, the other Jolson by Flewellyn Theatre Company was such a, um, a wonderful, unique opportunity and experience because it started with um, a love for the Jolson story and Jolson Sings Again. Me and my grandfather would would sit regularly and, and watch it. My granddad had a wonderful, wonderful singing voice and just that music just inspired me. And my granddad always said to me, I will go up and see, uh, we'll go see Brian Connolly now with Jolson. And it sadly never happened. So the next best thing was, right, one day, you're going to play Jolson. And then, um, I did get a chance to play Jolson. Um, Peter Whit Richards of Flewellyn Theatre Company was very gracious. I was chatting to him about my, my granddad, who was um, sadly unwell at the time. And... I said, oh, it'd be lovely if, you know, if you ever do anything about Al Jolson or if there's anything you can do about Jolson, um, you know, let me know. My granddad would love that and, uh, you know, do a couple of songs. And a spark went off in Peter. He said, leave it with me. Um, so Peter chatted to Francis Hardy, who, who was a local playwright, and they decided to put on a production based around not just Al Jolson, but the story of Larry Parks, because the... The movies were so important to me and my granddad. It was a sort of tribute uh, to my grandfather, and it was all very, very exciting. But unfortunately, my, my grandfather's cancer came back, and he he never got a chance to to see me on stage um, performing the role. Um, I did, however, hire out to a local theatre, and he got a chance to see me perform some songs as Jolson. But the play itself wasn't wasn't quite ready, so. We started the tour in the arts wing, and um, every night, obviously, that's what my granddad. It's a personal, personal journey, personal story, um, and there's moments within the show where Larry tears up um, and Jolson tears up, and that's a that's a channel to reconnect to my gramps. That is, and having toured and coming back to do a very special performance on the Grand Theatre main stage. And just, just feeling like I'd, I'd finished that promise, and hearing the the applause, and I was very blessed. There was a standing ovation, which was incredible, and um, it just, it kind of solidified my. It sounds very very theatrical. I do apologise. It, it felt like I solidified my um, my being within this theatre. I felt synonymous with the theatre, grand theatre, that's, that's where I belong. That, to quote today's youth, that's a bit of me. Um, I just felt that, you know, I was forever connected with this glorious, glorious building, um, especially because of that. Many other reasons too. Um, as I said, you know, I've performed here as a stand-up as well, um, a comedian, a show host, I've directed here, produced shows here. I've even painted scenery um, in the dock. I think it's very important that um, if you you experience things through like theatre that have helped you personally, that you pass that on um, and you, you pay it forward. And I've been fortunate that since the age of 16, I've 
been involved with various different um, local stage schools and organizations and I've helped teach drama um, and drama therapy and I kind of was was healing myself while teaching others um, you know it, it's very obvious when somebody's sometimes uh, having a diff difficulty in a class or you can see this there's something there that needs to either even if you just get somebody to just ah and scream it out or shake it out or let go of a frustration, channel it um, in something. You know, it's a release. It's an escapism we all need. Um, I've been fortunate to teach the feeder group of, of Harry's and I actually go back and, and teach like the next generation of uh, the Harry's Youth Theatre. Um, and now um, I actually teach, I'm head of drama and I teach drama here at the Grand for Men in Theatre Arts. And that's a wonderful um, opportunity my daughter um, is now a member of Harry's, so she's come through that rank too, which is lovely. Um, and she's also involved with Men and Theatre Arts also. Um, so it's a very personal building to me. Um, as I spoke about earlier, I've had many difficulties um, with the autism side of stuff and you know, not understanding certain things, not feeling like I, f like I fitted in. Um, there was a, a very traumatic time where I, I was um, bullied so bad in school that I I left in an ambulance and that was the last time I attended a school. Um, so having the support around you of um, youth theatres, of Amdram Productions, um, you know, I, I, back in the days um, of when I was 13, 14, you'd, I'd appear in other productions here from societies also. Um, it's just great. Everybody needs this uh, this escapism, and getting a chance to chat to the children and uh, you know sand them and take an idea and watch them blossom, inspire them to do something they wouldn't normally do, almost shake and break out of their cement mold and realize there's a bigger world other than what's suppressed or expected um, in a sort of military fashion. You know, it's not school utmost respect when you're in school you've got to follow certain rules when you come to something that's free and creative like drama uh, or singing or music it's important to get your voice out you know not not be bound by it and just be free really um and my favorite thing is seeing that in in, in the children themselves there'll be people that come to us and i've known a couple of years you know and um they've they've shied away from maybe wanting to do exercises and certain technique stuff and then you see a moment a pivotal moment where they change and you see that it cl something clicks within them and then it's like where did this voice come from thank you what, that was a bit thank you it's it's lovely um and then again you get others that on day one you know they're quite vulnerable and i see that in me i see young me a lot actually um and things i recognize now and it's nice to be able to orchestrate then. It's nice to be able to spin plates within a class, know what that person needs over there, know, know if that, that smile is going to turn into a frown, and whoa, 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 great, okay, distract them, now you're in that. Great, look what you've done. Look what you've done. I didn't do that, that was all you. You didn't know you could do it, did you? Well done. And it's that gratification then, and uh, giving them praise. It's important to encourage and, and praise efforts and the evolution, everybody's evolving um, in anything you do. You turn up at a, at a job for the first day, I suppose, you know, you're going a certain way by week two, three, four, you act totally different to how you did on your first day. You relax into it. I just, as I feel, I've relaxed into this theatre and I, you know, I love this place. It's, um, it is a part of me. I suppose most people, uh, you know, recognise the Swansea Grand Theatre from their childhood as Panto. That's where the panto lives. You're going into this building. Oh, this is where the panto is. I know I come here like once a year. Um, I have these sweets from there. We go here, shh, get in. And, you know, it's, it's the routine of panto. Um, I never obviously thought at such a young age going to see wonderful entertainers here. Um, Sir John Inman, um, you, you, the Chuckle Brothers, Joe Pasquale, um, Bobby Davro all of these giants of light entertainment and variety and of TV at the time. And of course, we had limited channels 
then it's not like now where you'd have every YouTuber <laughs> under the sun doing a flash mob in a panto, possibly. Um, you know, it was really special. These are mystical, magical people. And what? I get to go up and have something from Cadbury's. Uh, what, what do you mean I'm on stage? And they're talking to me and I'm like, it's a really incredible experience for every child. I loved the, the comics in the pantos and comedy I've got a natural affiliation with. Um, and there was, there was something about the villain, male villains. I'd seen a couple of male villains, but there was something about the, the male villain that always... I just enjoyed making my voice sound deeper and having this personality that was very different to, I suppose, the quite inward, shy me. Um, so I did used to love the, the, the comedians and laugh along, but I was always fascinated by the villains and also by their costumes and by the, the makeup. Um, and now when I, when I perform in, in the pantomimes as villain, um, I, I normally have sort of green and purple is my sort of colours and um, you know I had like green lipstick a green scar scars and stuff but I remember kind of seeing inspirational things back then or seeing things and going oh that's cool that stayed in my mind we're all squash we're like the entertainment squash we're all diluted versions of the things that have come before and um, yeah that's what I, I do yearly now I am a, a pantomime villain I used to be the panto comic um, so that's why I was touching on those two things. It's very strange to go to the extremes. Um, I was very fortunate to have done several years as a comic in Porthcawl at the Pavilion for Imagine Theatre, playing everything from Buttons to the Jesters in things like Snow White, um, Simple Simon. And, uh, yeah, I, I left Imagine Theatre's production with a, a boyish sort of Zac Efron slash... Um, Justin Bieber haircut all sort of clean and, and squeaky clean and you know look, looking like a TV presenter on CBBS type of stuff um, I grew a beard and I've been villain ever since so all I had to do was grow a beard and it's amazing uh, the psychological difference of that no um, yeah no I don't think um, I don't think I'd uh, shave the beard off it's become quite a good um, villain beard and um, I had a phone call um, from the agent saying that QDOS um, had seen me in Porth Call. Um, they had seen me a couple of times and they wanted to have a meeting with me. Um, I thought they'd had it wrong. I thought there was a different... I thought it was Stefan Dennis. There's a throwback. Uh, but, <laughs> but I thought they'd seen somebody else. And uh, I turn up, nervously got my two songs ready to go and I think it was in Pineapple Dance Studios at the time. Um, and I, I go up there and I'm... Oh, right, okay, villain, okay, villain, oh, okay. And then suddenly, ah, oh, Stefan, lovely to see you. Um, it was really lovely, and they, they were like, we've wanted to get you in for ages. Did my songs, had an informal chat, did some magic. Magic was a big, big thing that they wanted to push for. Um, and I've been, I'll tell you all this, <laughs> I'll tell you this in a weird way. So um, I started magic at a very young age also. I was the youngest ever button in Red Court. Um, at 13 so I'd left school with all the bullying and all the horrible things that had happened and my mother who was incredible um, managed to fight for me to be not only on a performing arts course and become the youngest ever person to do a national diploma in performing arts um, at what is now Gower College it was Sloinabrin back then um, she took me on holiday it was a, it's a quite a sweet story um, we were going on holiday I'd had this horrific uh, thing happen to me. I've still got a scar on my nose there. My eye was out like Quasimodo, and um, it was horrific. So I had sunglasses on, a swollen face like a hamster, and I was just hiding from everybody. And we're in Minehead for this holiday that was already booked, and we're walking up um, Minehead now, just walking up the street, and we see a magic shop. Now, I loved magic. I always had a fascination with the magic side of things, um, I was on a program called Jungle Run as a child, um, as a contestant, and Dominic Wood from Dick and Dom was, back then, was known more for being a magician. So he run a, there was a course at the Young Magicians Club uh, at the Magic Circle. I became a member of the Young Magicians Club, and I'd attend events and workshops, and there's some people like Ali Bongo would, uh, would attend and, and teach lectures. Um, but that was quite hushed, hushed. I didn't tell many people about that at the time. Um, I go to Minehead and we go to the shop 
and uh, the man can notice that I'm looking, you know, a little bit down. And my mum kind of explains that I've had a hard time in school. And the guy goes, oh, yeah, shall I, um, shall I see our TV? He didn't even talk. I don't know why he did that. But um, <laughs> no, he said, do you like CITV? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen CITV. And mum goes, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, look, it's a Stephen Mulhoon magic. You like Stephen, don't you? He goes, oh, you like Stephen, do you? Yeah, he'll be down in a minute. He's my son. So it was Stephen Mulhoon's father and mother that, that owned this shop in Minehead. Now, his sister Susie was a red coat. Stephen used to be a red coat. And my mum got chatting to them about what had happened. And they were incredibly lovely and sweet to us. And from that conversation, they sorted out me having work experience as a red coat um, for the duration of the holiday. So it was only a couple of days. And, um, you know, I was very much in words, didn't kind of look around. Like everybody else is going, la, la, la. I'm going, mm, 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 mm. Um, it, it was, you know, it, I was not an entertainer at that moment. <laughs> um, but something changed in me. And the more I went around with these people, I felt that fire. I felt that uh, enth- enthusiasm and that magic, just like when I'd listened to Joseph as, as a child here at the Grand. Um, the power in music, the power in this incredible thing that's happening, this gift of energy ricocheting around everybody. And... I started to come out of my shell and it, I started learning the skills then to do comedy, um, to do stand-up, to control a room, um, even like the karaoke bar or in the skyline. You know, wherever you are and you've got the mic, suddenly you, you've put on the costume of a red coat, you've put on the fake smile <laughs> that you have to do. Um, and whereas I would be very inward and not, you know, I'd be quite... Hi. Suddenly it becomes, hi, how are you? All right, how are you? Good. Oh, great stuff. Yeah, just through there. And the pattern of that speech, you start to learn. Um, seeing the other people do it and you, you just emulate in. And, and that's where my sort of, I'm kind of known for, for biopics now and, and playing real life people. And um, I, I don't do impression as such. I, I try to get the essence and just seeing somebody and just replicating it and learning that through the red courts. Um, and Stephen Mulhern and his sister and they were incredibly lovely they invite me back for three consecutive summer seasons to be the youngest red court in Butlins for the entire the, the summer seasons um, and then I started performing magic getting corporate bookings at 13, 14, 15 um, I toured um, with other comedians loads of like real established magicians and comedians and I'd be like a support act this, this kid which was a bit of a gimmick at the time um, I was fortunate to do gigs in London's West End as well, um, performing and performing for some really high-profile companies like Coke, um, Sony employed me, Disney, um, and that stemmed to wanted to go down the route of stand-up comedy. Um, I, I always had the props and the magic, and I knew that I could rely on them if, if something went down not as good. Um, so props were always a, you know, a, a banker for me. But then I started leaving that um, and doing character comedy. So comedians who are like awful comedians. I was obsessed a little bit with the film Man on the Moon, where Jim Carrey plays Andy Kaufman. And that interested me, again, wearing you know, somebody else's costume and becoming another character. So it was all from the point of view as, a, as an actor, really. Um, and just, yeah, performing these characters like Donovan, the worst comedian in Wales, um, and now the awful Gwyn Jones, um, and just playing with the idea of comedy and how you can make an audience feel and how you can take somebody on a journey, what is art, what is theatre. Um, I'm known now corporately, and I've been very fortunate um, to, to, to play over Europe, um, and many, many different gigs, some in France, Oslo, Switzerland, um, and be employed as an immersive character actor. So bringing theatre to, to people where you wouldn't necessarily need a stage. Um, and that's fun, and just playing with the immersive theatre side of stuff. So I um, went up and had a meeting with Jonathan Kiley, and uh, you know, I sang my songs, and we had a good chat, and he made me feel really, really good, and um, you know, he'd said that he'd wanted to get me in for, for quite a while. Um, and then I didn't think anything of it. I, you're so used to, as an actor, 
going it's waters off a duck's back you, you kind of go to things and then suddenly you just forget about them because if you don't then it'll drive you bar me um, and I just get a call from the agent and they said what illusions have you got and I went oh right I don't know if you wanted to buy some illusions <laughs> illusions off me um, so I had various things with fire and stuff and like oh great um, they want you for Panto um, oh brilliant didn't know where it was it was a generic kind of meeting really it could have been anywhere um, the Swansea Grand and I was like what? no 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 way um, so having again having a chance then to come to the Swansea Grand to do my first pant of kudos um, and I came back a second time then a couple of years later um, the first one was uh, Jack and the Beanstalk and I got a chance to do my laser magic in that um, which is really cool lots of green lasers lots of fire um, some cages and stuff and getting a chance to colour coordinate the, the tricks and put them into the, the acting side was really nice. Um, and then coming back and playing Abenaza. Uh, so the first panto that I performed uh, here at the Swan de Grand Theatre was Jack and the Beanstalk. And I played Flesh Creep, uh, which was an incredible amount of fun. Lots of magic, lots of fire, my green lasers. Um, and I got a chance to sing some, some pretty cool songs too. I then went the following year to Wolverhampton Grand Theatre. Um, so the Grand was still with me somewhere, even in the architecture. Um, but I played Abenaza. So then I had a bit of a run playing Abenaza. I come back then to the Swansea Grand to play a very different type of Abenaza with a very long, long wig. Um, and uh, it, that was great with, with Tony Maudsley, um, Matt Edwards, and through meeting Matt at that panto, I went on to co-write and direct Matt's live show, um, which appeared on the main stage here then called Fourth, um, and we've kept in touch, and I've written various other things for Matt also. Um, Kev, you know, like, he's an incredible man. I like, constantly keep in touch with Kev. Like, every now and again, you'll send a message. It just brightens your day. Um, and of course, getting a chance to work with the legend Kev Johns as Dane twice, you know, that is just wonderful in itself. Um, and we've also done Shakespeare together. Uh, you know, it's like I never leave this place, and I'm so happy about that. Um, yeah, P Panto here at the Grand, it's just, it's just a wonderful experience. I think it's very important, um, you know, that people realise as well that it's not just on stage, the magic happens. Um, no production would go ahead without the crew, um, without the, the front of house staff and without the creatives. And if you know that something like education isn't your strong point, the same as me, um, or you have certain difficulties and certain things that you've, you've got to still overcome and, and you're trying to find your place to fit in, um, you know, focusing on something, creating and helping a production grow. We're all like ants together working. And if you're behind a camera, if you're thinking about costume, you're designing a costume, you're thinking about the lights, you're, you know, helping with the structure side. Like maybe you're really organised. I'm not. <laughs> so I'm the opposite. I'm, I'm messy. You know, if, if you throw like matchsticks on the floor, I'll just go, I'm not picking that up. So that's basically, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the cool side. Um, so yeah, any, anything that helps you and you know that it makes you feel right within the bracket of entertainment, within theatre, within performing, it should be highly encouraged. Um, feeling a part and a sense of the community um, within a production also. Um, and it was wonderful opportunities and it's nice to see that um, you may have inspired certain people to kind of find their own wings and, you know. My hopes for the future of this building are that audiences continue to support this incredible, incredible theatre. It has such history, has such such heritage. Um, there's nothing quite like walking into um, a show home um, or going to a place like a well, set, in my experience, and just knowing that it, it all feels a bit fake and and. and you know, unliving, walking into the grand, you're hearing the echoes of the past, you're feeling the energy of every show that's ever come before it, you're feeling the waves of every clap that's hit, um, it really has that, that feeling in, in this theatre, and 
you know, it's such a rich, rich heritage of performers who have appeared on this stage. Um, it's, incred- it's incredible when you look. Um, so I hope this will stay. Um, I'm sure with the incredible team of Grand Ambition, um, you know, local theatre companies will also be encouraged, you know, to to continue performing and supporting. And it's the community feel of the Grand. You know, it does feel like everybody has a part in it. It feels like everyone in Swansea owns it a bit, even if it's just for two hours at a Christmas time when you turn up with your family for a panto, you're still a part of this wonderful, wonderful building. Another wonderful memory I have is the musical Swansea Women by Lynn McKay. And it ran for a week here on the main stage and it had everybody um, who I I knew from my societies and the professional work. It was a a hybrid of um, professional actors and you had people like Claire Hammercott, um, Philip Aaron, uh, Mena Trussler, um, Dudley Owen, um, you had then the other side of people who'd come through the ranks of things like Cockett Amateurs and Swansea Amateurs um, and even some people from Harry's. It was a it was a wonderful community experience that was of a brand new musical written by Lynn and it championed Swansea and it was a musical, a homegrown musical about Swansea and having it here at the Grand, it just, it just made sense. It just felt so, so good. Um, another memory I have, another musical, a memory I'd like to forget, is when the lights didn't go out uh, in time uh, when we did the Four Monty. And um, let's just say that night, I think everybody saw a little bit more of the Swansea Grand Theatre than they expected. Um, yeah, that was that was an experience. That was an experience. Um, so yeah, those are my those are my memories of Swansea Grand. Theater. It was cold, right? It was free. It was. They fixed the... Uh, I, hope, I hope none of you saw it. I love the Swansea Grand. 